Well, good evening, everyone. And you're very welcome to uh, tonight's conversation with Derek Reeve and Brendan Butler. So my name is Monica Thompson, and I'm delighted to uh, be sharing the hosting role with our good friend, Rab, and Callum, whom you know has got excellent uh, previous skills uh, demonstrated in terms of keeping us um, well controlled and um, on time. So um, I think in terms of getting us started, it is our normal custom in terms of um, beginning our proceedings um, as the Scottish Laity Network for a moment of silent prayer. So if we could just have a quiet moment just to gather our thoughts. So tonight we recall Bishop Pedro Casaldelagia, who died on August the 8th. He was known in Brazil as the Bishop of the Poor due to his unrelenting defense of the indigenous population and of supporting the struggle of peasants for land ownership. The retired Bishop of Sao Felix was seen as an enemy by land barons, miners and loggers. He powerfully advocated in his writings, in his poems and above all in his lifestyle the radical challenge of following Jesus. Being Christians today in Latin America where the spirit and the blood are pressing can only mean striving passionately to be, to really and freely be to the scandal of the world and the church. It means being new persons in a new church for the sake of a new world. So let us pray that tonight we may honour the memory of Bishop Pedro by opening ourselves to a new people for a new church for the sake of a new world. And now we pray the prayer to the Holy Spirit by Diamond Omerchu. Let us pray for the grace that individually and collectively we will be filled with the utter fullness of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, breathe down upon our troubled world. Shake the tired foundations of our crumbling institutions. Break the rules that keep you out of all our sacred spaces and from the dust and rubble, gather up the seedlings of a new creation. Come, Holy Spirit, inflame once more the dying embers of our weariness. Shake us of our complacency. Whisper our names once more and scatter your gifts of grace with wild abandon. Break open the prisons of our inner being and let your raging justice be our sign of liberty. Come, Holy Spirit, and lead us to places we would rather not go. Expand the horizons of our limited imaginations. Awaken in our souls dangerous dreams for a new tomorrow and kindle in our hearts the fire of prophetic enthusiasm. Come, Holy Spirit, whose justice outwits international conspiracy, whose light outshines spiritual bigotry, whose peace can overcome the destructive potential of warfare, whose promise invigorates our every effort to create a new heaven and a new earth, now and forever. Powered by the Spirit, 
we continue the mission entrusted to us. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And so to tonight's business, in responding to our assembly, our very successful day, following our journey of discernment, uh, a number of issues were raised around uh, structures and processes, about whether we're a movement, a network, um, and really uh, looking at ourselves and, and, and a little bit more um, forensically in terms about how we might uh, function more efficiently as we move forward. And it was, uh, it was very clear from those um, sharing of ideas and uh, questions that were posed that um, there were many uh, similar bodies um, much further down the line who had um, parallel uh, aspirations as ourselves. And it might um, be valuable to us uh, to have some focused conversations um, with those organizations as we discern our way forward in, in terms of uh, improving our effectiveness. So amongst those bodies, we have two very long-standing movements, uh, namely ACTA, which is the uh, a call to action, and the uh, body called We Are Church Ireland. Uh, so tonight, we are delighted to um, welcome uh, both Derek Reeve from ACTA and Brendan Butler from We Are Church Ireland. And both of these uh, um, good men and their uh, organizations, they are uh, going to share their stories of their successes and, and, and hopefully equally explore some of the challenges and pitfalls that they, they've experienced over uh, the number of years as they've grown in strength and to, uh, in strength and strength uh, over, the, over the years. So it is an opportunity for us to listen and learn um, uh, as engaged lay people as we grow in our faith, living out our mission um, and our common priesthood in new ways of working. So Derek is a retired priest from uh, Portsmouth. He is a founder member of ACTA, um, a body that was uh, established way back in 2012. And it's a movement built from below by clergy and laity alike in um, every diocese in England and Wales. Brendan, on the other hand, uh, Brendan is from uh, North Dublin. He's a retired teacher and a father of five. In his early uh, 20s, uh, Brendan trained as a Franciscan friar, but left before his ordination. And in 1979, he was a co-founder of the Irish El Salvador Support Committee. And during the 1980s, was a very active player in the international uh, resistance to US-backed uh, death squads. So uh, Brendan certainly has um, past experience in, in terms of challenge and reform. And he brought much of that experience uh, to um, to the, uh, the organization We Are Church Ireland and has been a founding um, coordinator from its inception. So tonight, both um, gentlemen are going to share a little bit more of their organizations. And I know as participants, um, you've all had at least uh, the broad mission statement, aims and objectives of both bodies out in an attachment um, as part of the general invitation and promotional material. Um, However, both Brendan and Derek have agreed to just to flesh out a little bit more on their organizations and share with you um, their experiences. Uh, and then hopefully that will prompt you to please uh, in, engage with them in some uh, focused conversation. The usual fashion is to post those on the chat box, but uh, in advance, we invited you to, to please um, contribute, and many of you have done that. So we will be mixing and matching those questions that have been already posed and those that will come up in the course of our conversation. So may I please invite uh, Derek perhaps just to kick off proceedings and to share with us his experiences as the co-founder of um, ACTA. Derek. Thank you very much. Um, I feel a bit of a fraud really because uh, I'm not very involved with ACTA at the present moment, but it was some, somewhere in the autumn of 2011 that 
I was impressed by the Catholic Association or Association of Catholic Priests in Ireland, and I thought we ought to have something similar in this country. Um, my own contacts were very few for various reasons. I had very few um, contacts with the clergy. So I, I got in touch with those that I did know who I thought might have a similar view of things. And we held a meeting in London. And from that meeting, eventually, we, we held a meeting for priests again and mustered about 70 priests, I think. Uh, and from that, we decided to have a day uh, conference at Heathrop, and uh, we didn't expect so many as actually turned up. We had to transfer the meeting from Heathrop to the Church of St. Mary Abbots, which is just opposite, and we had upwards of 400 people at that meeting, I think. I myself was terribly ill all day, so I didn't really enjoy the meeting very much. But from that, we um, set up ACTA. The name came from... Uh, a letter that seven of us wrote to the tablet, and the tablets uh, he headed the letter, a call for action. And when we thought of a name, we thought that's quite a good name, and it's a good acronym, ACTA, that's how we got the name. Our intention was, first of all, that it shouldn't be a clerical movement, although we'd started by gathering priests together, it was very, very important to me at any rate that it shouldn't be a clerical movement, that it should be a movement of the church. And in our, um, in our um, mission statement, we say some of whom are ordained. I was very anxious that it should make it clear that we're all on the same level. A few of us are ordained. In fact, that number, I've, I think, has remained comparatively few, and it is very largely a lay movement. Um, from that, we began to try to set up uh, groups in every diocese. And I think to a large extent, we were successful, but the actual progress of each, each diocese has been very, very different. And uh, I think it's only in a few dioceses that we can say that we have had any real response. Generally speaking, I think I, I speak from with no real knowledge, but I think generally speaking, the clergy have not responded. Um, our aim was to try to encourage dialogue with the bishops, and that has proved almost completely a non-starter because the bishops just don't want to dialogue, frankly. So we have had to move back into being a different sort of organization to a certain extent, and the groups themselves were meant to be groups which would support each other and also, of course, uh, search together for the way forward. To be quite honest, I think to a certain extent we've taken a wrong turn because while we have organized national events uh, and conferences and so on, uh, we have neglected the encouragement of the diocesan groups. And in Portsmouth, certainly, we've never managed to gather, more, well, we have 70 people on our books, most of them are not very active, largely due to our age, but we have um, a small group at Winchester and a larger group in Portsmouth. But the problem really was, what were we supposed to be doing? Because um, it's all very well organizing conferences and so on, but you find yourself talking to the same people all the time and uh, preaching to the, the already converted. And so our objective was to try to gather people into groups, uh, and in some places that had been successful. The purpose of the groups as I see it, but this is me and not actor really, but as I see it would be to be support groups, would be to be house churches in fact, would um, have some sort of clout with the institutional church, so I don't um, have too many hopes there, and um, would above all, create little groups of people who they are the church. Uh, for that, they would need, of course, to um, meet together regularly and to break bread together. And uh, uh, then I think they should also, but this is again me talking, um, they should also make themselves known to the local clergy. And if the local clergy said you can't do that, then I think they've just got to say, but we do, we will. So that's roughly the background of ACTA. We have quite, um, 
quite a, a strong sort of organization in a central group which is composed of representatives of every diocese. As I say, uh, many dioceses are not, uh, well, the numbers are very small, and so the person representing the diocese will have very little to say. Um, and again, I think that uh, in organizing national events, we have lost our way a little bit. One thing that is being planned by the National Coordinating Group is a series of talks very much like your own. Um, and from that, I hope that we will begin to attract new members. But again, I'm not desperately uh, positive about it. My own feeling is that the way forward is in small groups and that people must set these up themselves and uh, move forward and have the actor itself as a sort of umbrella organization to support and encourage them. But I wouldn't want to say any more than that now. I hope that gives you a flavor of what we've been doing and where we're at at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Derek. No doubt uh, there will be opportunities for you to elaborate a bit more fully on, um, on, on matters in, in, in questions. Thank you indeed. Sure. Brendan, how do you feel about following on? Yes, I'm ready. Good man. Yes. Well, first, I'd want to apologize to all the women present because normally uh, we always, uh, if we're asked uh, to address a meeting, we always have a man and a woman. And women are very important in that sense because our main uh, core group, we always, what our main aim really in the whole organization is that no matter what we do, we try and reflect what the church of the future should be. So in that sense, we want equality. Therefore, in the main group, the core group, three men, three women. And that's a, a very core principle. And uh, so just from there, it's just to explain the background, as Monica was saying, I became involved in uh, Latin America 1979 until about 1985, a long time. And uh, we worked with Franciscans in, in Central America and then later on in, in Brazil, right down. And uh, we worked a lot and we were very active and we had groups throughout Ireland. And indeed, there were groups throughout Europe as well. So, and then we, I became involved then in other groups as we, we, with the uh, Algerians and also with, uh, we have a peace alliance. We, that was before. And all of this time I was involved here at, back in Ireland, uh, just attending conferences. And there was a fairly active uh, lay participation. It actually, in fact, I, I'm not keen on the word lay at all because uh, that's the meaning of our thing. We say we are a church. There's no distinction, and I, I, we fight for this, no distinction between clergy and laity. We are a church. So therefore, we say we're non-ordained. So as members of the non-ordained part of the church, and, and we believe really we are ordained because of our baptism. So it, it's very hard just to try and put a word, but we leave the word laity there for the moment. And as a result, after the Second Vatican Council, there was a great life, a life in the church, and I'm sure it was right throughout Europe. And especially here in Ireland, there were fairly groups, priests who left the priesthood formed a group, and sisters who left the, the, the the convents also, they joined together and they had a group, a very strong group here called Basic Brothers and Sisters in Christ. And so they were there also uh, gay, there was a strong gay Catholic organization called Gay Catholic Voice. And uh, there was one or two other organizations and I used to just attend them. And then uh, you could see those organizations just dying and dying and dying away. So at one particular stage, uh, especially after the explosion of the sexual, uh, clerical sexual uh, abuse scandals here in Ireland, which rocked the church, uh, at one particular meeting, 
a lot of the groups that were finished with the church. Like, for example, basic, the gay Catholic voice say, uh, said there's no hope the way we're discriminated against. So at that stage, a group of us got together and said, we'll have to try and keep, keep the spirit of Vatican II going. And uh, so at that stage, we were grappling like yourselves, what way will we go forward? What organization will we have? And uh, someone in the group said, there was a group around which has more or less died and it was called We Are Church. And it was in existence for about 10 years and very successful. So we said, why reinvent the wheel? So therefore we examined it and about, there must have been about 50 of us at that stage, we decided that we would uh, adapt the We Are Church model and we contact international group. There's no real uh, structure as such. You don't have to contact anyone. You just become, we are, we call ourselves, we are Church Ireland. And then we uh, contacted the international group because we are church is present throughout Europe, throughout Latin America, America. And uh, that's, oh yeah, South Africa as well. So it, it, it's, so we adopted that model and we became, we are church and uh, from very small beginnings and we did have a constitution but it's a very loose structure and for example uh, for we have an AGM and there's you know there are fairly fairly strict rules about that you know and we also have registered as a legal charity in Ireland so our primary role is not to collect money, but still just we're accountable to uh, the charita charitable director here of the government. So in that sense, we like to be in a position that we must be accountable. So we're accountable for everything, unlike our present structure of the church. So we, in that sense, uh, that's an important part. The presence of women in the group, in, in the organization is very important. And uh, it, it, because we want equality in the church and there's no use talking about equality. So that's why I feel a bit of a, a fraud here talking about women and it should be a woman herself to talking about it. Uh, we also are fairly, uh, a lot of gay people are in our group, both, both gay priests and gay women. And uh, so they are a strong voice and uh, we represent, you know, we, uh, we we allow them to represent themselves uh, with us, so it, it's not a case uh, we we're speaking always for them. But they're quite strong anyway, and we try and encourage a strong gay voice within our organisation. And <clears throat> so, they're the main uh, the challenges. Then uh, we then uh, were contacted by the media. And we we made that a very important part of our or, uh, of our how would you say structure. We contacted all the newspapers and the television stations and the radio stations, and as a result, uh, we have built up a very strong relationship uh, with the Irish media. And uh, for example, every week I get a call from local radio say, will you talk about this? Will you talk about that? Uh, and uh, it, I, I used to be the official spokesperson. I'm not anymore. And uh, the newspaper would ring you up after the Pope said something asking for your comment. So in that sense, we, we have, uh, that's our way of trying to influence the, uh, the church that we are a presence in society to other Catholics. And other Catholics say, that is terrific. You know, I just heard you on the radio. I never realized there was a, a group of Catholics who wanted reform. And, uh, and so it, it's to give encouragement to ordinary Catholics. And I think we, rep we do represent a, the vast majority of Catholics especially uh, looking for change in the church. For example, the, the, something like 70% of uh, Catholics did vote for marriage equality. 
which is the first time ever, you know, in the history the, uh, uh, of Europe that uh, that it happened. So we have great changes, but the problem is that Catholics who are baptized Catholics are the only ones remaining are around our age. And that's why I see Callum there and they say, oh, we're jealous of people like that because we find that younger people will tend to be attracted to opus day to that type of, uh, of a, they're looking for certainty. And we say, we cannot give you certainty because we're looking for a new church. Uh, we, meet, uh, we meet once a month and we organize, for example, uh, we work with other organizations and with the Association of Catholic Priests, uh, with Father Tony Flannery. And, you know, we made a big, uh, what would you say, campaign at the time when Father Tony Flannery and the other priests were silenced and uh, we picketed bishops, we picketed the papal nuncio, et cetera, et cetera, wrote to the Pope. We actually, we even went over to the Rome and we picketed outside the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. And uh, I actually got in and, uh, and I didn't get too far before I was apprehended because you have to go up to the fifth floor. So in a sense, we have been active, trying to be active. And as it's, I was very impressed with that prayer of Padre Gamorhu, you know, the, uh, the prayer of the, of the, for the spirit, because we do concentrate, we feel we, that is a very important part because we need the support and the spiritual support of the spirit especially. And we organize Advent liturgies, we are liturgies and we encourage house masses and we're involved in that ourselves. So the, the main, just to finish up really, uh, oh yes, we are members of international organizations and we, we value that very much. We, we are members of women's ordination worldwide and they're mainly American, European organization, but all composed of, all, of women. And we are active members of that. And then we are active members of another group uh, of uh, Catholic priest organizations and lay organizations called the International Catholic Reform Network. And uh, I was at a meeting there not so long ago in Prague. And so we, I think you come back invigorated from them because you're meeting up with other organizations and uh, for example here in Ireland we organized uh, We Are Church International to come over here and it was really invigorating to have so many people coming and with new ideas but the same ideas persist. The reform of the church which many people say is irreformable so anyway that is our challenge and I think that's enough. From, um, from <laughs> Excellent. Well done. Thank you, Brendan. That's certainly um, a, a good starter for 10. Um, lots, lots of common ground there uh, between both uh, your organisations in terms of um, connections between laity and clergy, um, a, a strong um, interest in empowering laity or the uh, non-ordained to exercise their baptismal responsibilities and really for uh, gender equality and uh, opportunities for reform and renewal. So we can see lots of parallels uh, between your bodies and, and indeed the challenges that are, are facing us in, in our early stages of, of, our, of our growth. So thank you both for, for that. Um, I'm quite sure there are a, a number of questions individuals might want, want to uh, uh, have a conversation with you uh, around, uh, but perhaps just to get our uh, discussions under underway, we might be able to um, look at some that we have um, received in, in the last week or so from um, participants. Um, and perhaps, um, Callum, if you're um, if you're there, we might be in a position, perhaps, to um, look at some of the questions that have been um, received. Uh, we. 
took the opportunity to send them to Brendan and Derek in advance, just so they had, had a little flavour of what um, people were exercised about, so they've had an opportunity just to consider those. So perhaps we'll, 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 we'll draw upon um, one of those. And uh, since Brendan has just been speaking about the broader international uh, dimensions of his organisation, looking a bit outwardly as well, perhaps we might um, pose um, Dan's question uh, as a starter. So Derek, if you'd be happy to do that. Yes, yes. Thank you, Monica. I'll just read that for, for everyone's benefit. So um, Dan says, we are called to opt for the poor, the needy, the orphan, the widow and the stranger. How should the Scottish Laity Network make that option? Through something more than our own actions as individuals, perhaps? Through urging address, uh, through urging address to authority in the church? and in civil power nationally and internationally, or perhaps by all these means. Uh, Dan invites perhaps yourself, Derek, first of all, to, to advise from the experience of your own organisations. Well, I think um, my experience of, from the organisation is not very great in that sense, but I think individual action obviously is very important. And so um, ACTA and any organisation of this kind ought to be encouraging people to take individual action themselves. I think um, trying to uh, liaise and work with church authority, I don't know what it's like in Scotland, but here I have to say that it's very much a non-starter in most of the dioceses. So I don't think one ought to waste too much time trying to dialogue with people who don't want to dialogue. But I think that certainly we ought to be encouraging people to join those organizations and movements which are in the business of building the kingdom of God. I mean, for instance, in Scotland, I think Christian nuclear disarmament would be a very appropriate thing for you to be involved in, given your own situation, or the campaign against the arms trade, or reprieve and uh, movements about prisoners, or um, things going on in other countries and so on. So I think uh, the organisation ought to be encouraging people to join those things and to be seen to be involved with those things because that I think is an area where younger people would be interested and if they saw that the church was concerned for those things which they're concerned for, I think that might give us some way of linking in with younger people. Perhaps Callum would have an idea about that. But I, I don't want to say any more about that, I think. Thank you, Derek. Perhaps, Brendan, if I could pose the next question to, to you. Um, and it comes from, from Margareta, who asks, it seems clear that one of the main aims of your organisations is the empowerment of the laity. How do you respond when governance issues in a diocese are brought to your attention? And how do you negotiate a response with your membership? Yes. I, I... The main, uh, just looking at that particular question, the empowerment of the laity, I suppose, is just to recognise our own, our, our, our own dignity. But uh, we we are a part of a structure of the institutional church, and uh, people do say to us, uh, "You're." you're always criticizing the church. You're looking for this, you're looking for that. You want change, change, change. And we're saying, well, of course we are. And uh, they say the best thing then is, will you leave the church and go off and join a Protestant organization, you know, which has uh, married priests and which has uh, married uh, women priests, etc., etc. So from that point of view, what we say is we're not leaving because we are a part, we are church. We're baptized into the church and no one has a right to exclude us because we hold uh, for, the you know, for the basic Christian doctrines and uh, apart everything else is peripheral. And in, in that sense, how can you influence the institution of the church? Well, lately we have been uh, involved uh, you know, in Amiens, in, in France, a, a woman has put herself forward to be a, a new cardinal. And so we are, we, the present Archbishop of Dublin is retiring within the next six months. 
So we're, uh, we are going to organize lay people, non-ordained, to get together and we will nominate priests that we know and even women that we know, doesn't matter, and we will nominate them. That's because we have a right, we are the church. Why is it that only uh, a selected few, even a priest, a lot of priests are, are never consulted. So a very selected few are, 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 are authorized to, and we believe that that is the way, if we could just get bishops that reflect like Pedro who died, uh, uh, people like that, who, who, uh, Oscar Romero, the great people, if we could only, we don't have anyone like that. And if we only had, now how, it's no use crying about it. This, we have to say is, can, you, uh, can we organize a plan and can we get the voice of non-ordained people to influence the church? And the biggest way is if we could get bishops that reflect our aims. And so that is really uh, a, a part, I suppose, to try, we have so many things to do when you look at through the, the, the problems in the church and you say, well, that's another major effort because that will take up a few months of our time and we'll have to, you know, leave other items uh, aside. But that is an important thing, the governance of our church and who governs and we can't we can't just say uh, break away we, we don't intend to break away we are members of it and we're going to influence it and how do you influence it and there are questions i think that uh, your organization can do as well and uh, but we do have a right years ago it was hundreds of years ago a uh, denomination of bishops were from the lay people and the priests of, of each particular diocese and they nominated people and they voted them uh, voted them in and then sent the name to Rome. It wasn't Rome that no so all of that needs to be uh, worked on. Okay. Thank you. Um, if I come back to, to Derek but perhaps we could get an opinion from you, you both on this next question. I'm going to turn to the, the chat function now and take the question from Kate, who says, there's so much anger and fear in the world right now. Because the Scottish Laity Network was founded by, as a result of governance issues in the Diocese of St Andrews in Edinburgh, my question would be, Jesus went into the temple and threw over the tables and stalls. How can we channel our anger and our frustration as a movement? at the frustration of church that that it listens to the voices of an informed laity and uh, in a spirit of mutual respect how can we work towards that have acta and and we are church ireland found that to be possible or should we be prepared to be more forceful i wonder if you could comment on that derek and then i'll turn to, to brendan yes well um I'm always saying to people that they forget they do have one method of leverage, or leverage as they say these days, which is the purse strings. And if people who are dissatisfied with the church would only stop putting money in the collection, I think that would bring many clergy to heel. Um, and there was an article in the tablet last week about the financial situation of the church, which is pretty dire. But that's by the way, in a sense, because I think that. Um, it's terribly difficult to influence uh, the authorities of the church. And uh, it's um, very discouraging for people who try to do so, I think. Um, I haven't got any real advice on that matter because I think from experience that writing to bishops and uh, petitioning to nuncios and so on just doesn't work. So again, I come back to my previous answer and that is, I think, People have got to get together in support groups and insist we are the church. I agree totally with what Brendan says. We are the church. We're all laity because the laos is the holy people of God. And we've got to insist that we are part of the church and we have got to gradually gather some, some clout by having more and more of these groups. So I don't have any easy answer otherwise, I'm afraid. Thank you, Derek. Um, if I can pose the same question to, to you, Brendan, this idea of 
can we work towards a, a sense of mutual respect? Have you found that possible? Um, and, and if I can take another question from, from our pre-submitted questions to go alongside it, Kevin asked, is the institutional church listening to these voices of reform? Is the door open in any way? Yeah, I would be the same as Derek. You know, it, it's you, you just feel fro so frustrated that uh, bishops just refuse even to answer our letters. Um, the Association of Catholic Priests in Ireland have been asking for meetings with bishops for the last, since they, for the last, what, eight years. And eventually they, the bishops met them last year. But it was a very frustrating meeting anyway. So it's, you know, unlike, if I remember we were reading about Archbishop Romero, there was a meeting in the Diocese of, of San Salvador, of laity, of all, of, of all the people, and there was a vote taken. And the last person to cast his vote was Romero. So that's the type, you know, he stayed behind, listened to people. So in that sense, it's very difficult because some of our members are members of the parish councils and they find it very frustrating. Uh, so, or is it that we try and reform the church from below and just move ahead. If we find injustices, especially like Tony Flannery, we believe in action. For example, last Good Friday, we marched through the streets of Dublin and, uh, you know, and uh, so talking about, you know, the importance of repentance in the church and all of the abuse. And you, you do get a great response from people. People stop you. And for example, this year, or, or it was last year, the Gay Pride a organization, quite, quite a big organization here in Ireland, uh, we became a member of it. And we took our banner and we marched with the Gay Pride uh, organization. And people came up to us afterwards and said, that was great to see Catholics uh, in a march with, gay, with, with, the, you know, with the Gay Pride. So in a sense, I think, don't be daunted by anything. Just, we, we can't become, you know, we can't influence everything, but we can be in solidarity with other groups, with the Gay Pride uh, Organization, with the refugee groups. We don't have to be able, we don't have to do it ourselves. We have to support, they support us and we'll support them as an organization. And I think that's as much as we can do. Because we can't, I can't, I'm a member of refugee groups, etc. but we can't be all, we have enough to do with our aims trying to reform the church. And through the reform of the church, we have to be visible in society, not to influence young people, but to let them see that the, the message of Jesus is one of radical change of society where everyone is welcome and, and equal. And uh, so in that sense, the church has done enormous damage, I think, to the message of Jesus, because people judge the message of Jesus by seeing the church. And they're seeing the church with pedophile priests, etc. And one thing after the way they, they call the gay people disordered women can only come in and, you know, they're just servile people. So all of these things are there, injustices in the church. And we have to get a bit angry, righteous anger. Like, as you were saying, Callum, uh, that Jesus went into, I, I, I've just written a bit about it. And I, what, what I proposed was, I think Jesus got the rest of his, uh, of his uh, gang, or of his apostles, and they organized and they went into that temple and they really shook it up a good bit. A while and so that's what I think we have to have uh, uh, this anger we have to anger and uh, if bishops don't meet as well we'll say well that's there that's oh, that's very sad but we are the church and we we have to respond if they don't do it we have the responsibility and how do we do it and that's the challenge to you and to me and to all our groups 
how do we put forward the message of Jesus to this generation? It's not just reform of the church, it's to create a new a, a, a new organize a, a new what would you say a new people of god on the march and we're on the march and there's no one going to stop us who can stop us as saint paul says you know if god is on our side who can stop us so in that sense we have to get a bit of anger and don't be limited oh the bishop said you can't do it don't that is a lot of baloney, you know, as Mary McAleese said, all that theology is codology, an awful lot of it. And we have to be able to say it and to say it out through the media as well. Your Scottish newspapers, there's plenty, I'm sure, journalists, they'd love to, to print that. And, and, and that's the way forward. Bishops and the church, they hate to see criticisms of the church in the paper. And that's the, and if that's the only way we can do it, well, we do it. But, well done. Well, thank you, Brendan. You definitely have uh, uh, got our juices um, running there in terms of your, your righteous anger um, uh, to, to, to affect change. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly an, an arm that uh, we as an organization have, um, have, have, have considered. However, we, we are, um, we're dealing with a, a very broad um, tent and there are, there are indeed uh, many fearful individuals around the consequences of um, you know, open, open revolt, revolt and challenge. Can we perhaps maybe move on to um, some other questions, Callum? I wonder if just as a, a follow-up to the conversation there, Derek, if I could put this to you. It comes from Anne who asks, why is it that Catholic bishops seem to have so many problems in being able to listen or engage with church laity? Is it a question of fear? Is it like King Canute trying to hold back the inevitable tide? And what can be done to facilitate dialogue and collaboration? Well, I obviously, I'm speaking off the top of my head, and I don't know the answer, but I, I suggest that it stems from clericalism, which Pope Francis is always condemning, because I think that the clergy are brought up in a certain fashion, uh, in certain institutions, and they are brought up to, above all, respect and support the institution, and when a bishop becomes a bishop, I think he feels it's his first job to protect the institution in his diocese and so on. I think as well that, I don't know, but I feel that, and it's very arrogant of me to say this, but I feel that many bishops are not theologians. I'm not a theologian either, but I think many bishops are not theologians and they're very fearful of engaging in any sort of uh, discussion which might show that perhaps we've been wrong about something. They feel they've always got to toe the party line. And I know our previous bishop was pretty despondent about the, the conference of bishops because he said they will never disagree with each other. They all support each other. So I think there's fear there because they're fearful of, they, they in a certain sense, I think there's a lack of faith. And again, very arrogant of me to say so, but I think if you have faith, then you're not afraid to move the bricks in the wall and, and not believe the wall is going to fall down. But I think many of them feel that one little change and the whole structure will come down, which of course totally neglects the fact that Jesus assured us he would be with us to the end of time and that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. So I think there's fear and dare I say it, a certain ignorance amongst the bishops. Um, I think that they are put in a very unenviable, unenviable position because our bishop, for instance, he is a northerner who had no experience of the south of England at all, and it is very different, and the Catholic Church is very different in the south, and he's dumped into a diocese where he knows nobody, and he's expected to take on the diocese and deal with the diocese and so on, which I think is an injustice, actually. And of course, as uh, I think you said already, bishops should be chosen by the people from among the people. We've got the great example of Ambrose, who was chosen before he was baptized. And um, the people of Milan said, we want Ambrose, they got him. I think the whole idea of vocation has to be looked at again, because vocation has come to be seen as a personal conviction that I ought to be a priest, which is completely upside down. 
nobody had a vocation for the first few hundred years of the church. The vocation came from the church. People were called into the ministry uh, to serve the church. It was the church who called them, not the other way around. And that's always been a very firm conviction of mine. My vocation not to, didn't come because I felt I wanted to be a priest, but because the church, through the bishop, called me into service. So I think those are a few areas that um, are part of the reason why bishops feel it's very difficult to engage with people. And then after all, if you're a celibate man of 50 or 60, you've had no experience of life in a family or going out to do a job of work and so on, it's jolly difficult to engage with people who've got families, who are out of work and so on. It's all very well being nice, but it's very difficult to really get into their shoes. So I say I stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Brendan, if I can come to you uh, and, and take Rab's question from the chat, he asks, do you feel those who have left the church have also rejected the message of Jesus or have they just left to proclaim and live the good news of almost leaving the dead to, to bury the dead? It's, you cannot blame any person really for leaving the church really uh, but you never leave the church as such that it, i think the problem is with the word church you know that jesus never he didn't institute a church he, it was a movement of people and uh, so even though so many catholics especially women young women ha have just left the church and, and you know they're quite right and that is the and might be a duty to actually to leave the church because uh, and maybe that is one way if enough people left the church and uh, but that is a, an attitude it was present i think among past popes that they talked about the remnant in theology, it goes back to the Old Testament, you know, the, the, the prophecies at the end, there'll be only a remnant of the people of Israel. And uh, bishops, I think, a lot of them say, well, let them off. We don't want these people. They're always critical of the church. We just want people who, who are, you know, who, who are faithful. And that's the emphasis on the word, not faith as belief, but faithful, loyal, as loyal, as loyal soldiers. And they, and that's what they're looking for. We, uh, we had a world a meeting of, of, uh, of churches here in, last year, no, two years ago, and we applied as we are church, all the different organizations, you, you could, for about a thousand euro, we, we got a sponsor, the person sponsored us and we said, can we have a little spot, a table in there, we can give out leaflets. No, no. We fought and fought and fought. And so th they don't really want to, to hear. And th that can be very downheartening. And you say, well, let them off. <laughs> you know, don't be put out by these. By the, there, there is a little bit of hope. Pope Francis came along. And while he puts one step forward, he takes one step back. But at the same time, he, he, he is a, a breath of fresh air. A, in the church and there is a bit of there is hope there you know and he says go out the out in the world is a field hospital go out and do and do but what we're saying is that's all very well go out and help the poor but the church in the meantime this monolithic church refuses to change and it still discriminate. You see, we say is how can it talk about justice in the world when there's injustice in in its own society? You know, it talks about you know we should have justice for Syrian people, and, and that's all. That's right to talk about justice, but it's talk, and it it should it should come from justice should come. It should be consistent. And, it, and that's like what ourselves, your organization and our organization. We must be just in the way we treat each other and then we can, we can be credible. But yet there's no credibility in an organization preaching justice when, institute, when injustice is it's almost endemic within the organization. 
See, when you think of it, no woman can be allowed to get to move in. Gay, the discrimination against gay priests in America, it's just, it's just horrible, horrible type of, of situation. But we can't allow, and you have to admit that. Really, we say to you young people, look, it is a horrible situation. We're trying to, to fight it and, and trying to come up. And they said, well, when, it's, when you've done your job, we'll come in. But they know quite well we'll be dead and buried before that happens. Okay. Thank you, Brendan. Derek, if I can put a question to you from, from Anne, who asked uh, in advance, as we've journeyed through the, the, this, this journey, we've been supported by and have supported certain clergy. What was your experience of that? What were the difficulties and what were the advantages of priests and people supporting each other in working towards reform? Well, I, I have to say from my own experience that there hasn't been much of that. Um, I'm not aware in our diocese of any other priest who supported the actor, for instance. And there are one or two notable exceptions to that around the country. But generally speaking, the clergy are not supportive. I think that's partly because they're scared. Uh, and in many dioceses, they feel if they put their head above the parapet, they'll be shot down in flames. And also, of course, there's always the danger that they get a parish that they don't want, their move. The bishop has the whip hand there. So I think that clergy cooperation, in my experience, has not been very great at all. And that's why I do feel that um, people have to get on with it without the clergy. I don't feel there's much future in that, really. Uh, the other thing I would just say to the last question, just a word, and that is that I don't think people have... Um, lost their faith in Jesus when they've left the church. I think very often they've never been given that faith because they've been taught all sorts of stuff about the church, what they ought to believe and so on, but they've never been given the notion that I am a disciple of Jesus and I have to try to follow his way and live his, his sort of life in the world. So I think that's something which very often they haven't been given. So when they leave the church, they may well find that it's easier to follow Jesus as a member of a local group of CND or something than it is within the institutional church. However, that's just the thought. Mm. Thank you. Brendan, I, I wonder if you might comment on that question briefly as, as well, this notion of um, supporting one another and working together towards reform. Well, we are inclusive, uh, as you are, and we include anyone who's subscribes to the aims of We Are Church. And we have many priests and sisters who are very brave and they come to our meetings and we support them and, and uh, they support us. And while I wasn't ordained, I, I know what it's like, the, 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 you know, that the priest is totally in, under the power, under obedience, either to a bishop or to religious superior. And many find it very, very difficult in, in, to, to uh, even write for change. We have our example here of Father Tony Flannery. We have five other priests. Now, Tony Flannery, we support fully, and he's a member of our core group at the moment. And I think it's very important that they are in a very vulnerable position. And we have said to any priest, I said, if anything happens to you, let us know. And we'll go down and we'll put a permanent picket on the bishop who did that to you. Because we have to support, we can't allow that to, to continue. And so many priests, they, you know, and that's why silence, they silence these priests. Oh, what was Tony Flannery looking for? <laughs> it just ordination of women. And another priest totally excommunicated because he uh, uh, he, he allowed a woman to concelebrate with him on the altar. So, uh, and that means that person totally ex imagine excommunicated. You're not how, how dare, but they do. They, they they believe they have this power. So I think it's very important that we do include priests, and there are good priests out there willing you know, willing to put their heads with us and, and, and 
and, and demand change. But we have to be aware of their vulnerability. Yeah, nothing, I, I often say now, I'm retired, but when I was a, a deputy principal, I, I, I could be in a, 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 in a vulnerable position. I never bothered, maybe that's why I never became a principal, but you, you, you must uh, be aware of, and I think it's very important that we, we, we do, there's so many priests out there and even supporting them. That's what the Association of Catholic Priests try to do, but we should also, because they can do nothing to me. I can, you know, they can't, I don't care if they excommunicate me, it makes no difference to me. And, but it does to a priest, because now, 50 years later, he's 60, 70 years of age, where can he go? He's out the door. And uh, th that is a total injustice. He has no right of appeal, any of these things. So we have to be able uh, to fight on their behalf as well. Look for reform of the judicial system in, in the Catholic Church. The more you see it, the, the worse it becomes because our job is such a, a, a vital part but Callum, just coming back to it, I think it's very important that we support each other and we invite priests in uh, and sisters. Sisters are fearless people too, the fearless women, the most fearless women you ever meet are, are sisters who are devoted to reform. And they're vulnerable as well. So in that sense, we welcome everyone. It's very interesting, Brendan and Derek, to, to hear that that collaboration seems to have come about, whether I say easier, I don't know if that's correct, you know, if that's the correct term, but it seems to be more evident um, from what you're saying in, in Ireland, Brendan, than it is in the UK. I wonder perhaps if we could explore, Brendan, a little bit more. Is there something that you did to encourage that collaboration, to invite clergy to join the group more actively? Is there something that, that went more successful, something that helped that process? Yes, uh, I assume, I don't know now the position of priests up in Scotland. There's no association of them. They're members of ACTA, but how, how do you go about uh, inviting priests? I'm, I'm sure many priests have been silenced because a part of the silencing is that you're not, you are officially not allowed to communicate this to the public. So uh, I know that for a fact here, and I know one priest, he died, he died like that, silence, he didn't tell anyone, Tony Flannery was, he went public on it, but it, it's so sad to see a priest who has devoted his life to the service of the people of God, and to be treated like that way, and he has no right of appeal, and so I, I'm sure if there's a priest up in Scotland and you do hear about him, I think that's your duty is to go and support that person and to try and uh, somehow communicate that to, to priests. It's difficult. We, we have the Association of Catholic Priests in Ireland and we work with them and we attend their AGMs and they know who we are and we invite them over. And so it's, it's just a, a way of... We've invited bishops, by the way, as well, but you might as well be uh, something in the wind. But th that, that is the position. But it, I think it's very important that priests to recognize the vulnerability of priests and not to criticize them too much, you know. And, if to, and a lot of them are afraid uh, to speak out. And when, I, when you speak to them privately, oh, yeah, they said, we need priests. And, and one old priest said, he said, he said, look, I have to go up to that convent of nuns to say mass every Sunday. Why can't they just take one of their own sisters and say mass up there and leave me alone and, and let them, you know, so there's, and he, he's a man, oldish man, and, uh, but he, he wouldn't say that in public. Bishop of Derry there about five years ago, he retired. And when he retired, he spoke of it for priests, women priests and for this. And we said to him, why didn't you say that when you were a bishop? But mm -hmm. you see, that's the vulnerability, this, this thing. And we need another few popes, progressive popes, before we can release these men from that uh, 
is deceptive obedience. When I, when I went in novitiate, it was quite common. You'd be asked to plant a cabbage upside down. Now, that's incredible, you'd be asked. But your obedience, so we, we did do that. You just put the thing upside down. and So it, it's, it's, to, it's to break the spirit of of independence in priests and in sisters that this train is a rigorous type of training and obedience so and that is the problem really is this obedience it's not, it's, it's not celibacy and it's not poverty it is that you're this absolute demand that you must do and if you don't do it out you go and that's very hard for a priest thank you brendan if I can cross to Derek um, and, and share this message with you that was posted in, in our chat and perhaps ask you to comment on it, where it says that the promise of Jesus being with us till the end of time that we mentioned earlier is used to silence the laity who are deemed to not have faith in the Holy Spirit guiding our church. And the, the person who posted it says, I see the Spirit moving more and more out with the church than in the institutional church. Perhaps you could comment on that and perhaps where do you see the Holy Spirit working there? Well I think that that's heresy to start off with because of course the Holy Spirit works within the church not within the clergy and the census fidelium is something which is totally ignored by most of the clergy and bishops but the Holy Spirit is moving amongst the laity the non-ordained I mean and uh, the non-ordained are very often far, far more advanced in their thinking and their believing than many of the clergy. So I think the Holy Spirit's moving there, but we've got to get together to build on that. Certainly the Holy Spirit's moving outside the church. And again, the Second Vatican Council gave us all the clues to that, that in other churches, ecclesial communities, and in other faiths, in the, the um, instruction about co collaboration with other faiths, and in, even in people of no faith at all. You've only got to look at the recent experiences of people during the pandemic. Loads of people were uh, doing wonderful things. That's the Holy Spirit at work building up the kingdom of God, uh, risking their lives to care for people. Or you've only got to look at the terrible situation in the Lebanon, and people are coming together and uh, working together and so on. That's where the Holy Spirit is active, I think, and that's what we've got to convince people of. The Holy Spirit is not the prerogative of the church. The church is meant to be a sign to the world of what the Holy Spirit's doing, and that's why we ought to be a body of people who are outward looking and concerned for all the areas that the world is concerned for. And so I, I firmly believe the Holy Spirit's at work. The problem is that the clergy and the bishops are not noticing it. They think that the Holy Spirit is at work in the status quo, and that's it. But anyone who says uh, the Holy Spirit is there in the church, you've got to listen and obey, I think you've just got to say to that, uh, that priest, sorry, but that's heresy. The Holy Spirit is at work in the whole church. Go back and read the council documents. Splendid. Thank you, Thank you Derek. Much. Uh, Derek, perhaps I could stick with you for the, the next question and, and just pose this from Eileen, who asks, in going forward, we'd appreciate discussing what it means for a lay person to live being anointed at baptism as priest, prophet and king. How do we live up to that in various aspects of our life? Well, I think that um, those categories are quite difficult, but I think everyone in the church, every Christian, every disciple of Christ, has a prophetic vocation. They're called to speak out and to speak on behalf of God. That's what a prophet does. So whenever they speak uh, the truth about a situation, I come back because it's on my mind, coming back to nuclear weapons. Uh, any person who's speaking up about the abolition of nuclear weapons, they're exercising their prophetic role. And um, the priestly uh, rec uh, I think the priestly activity of the member of the church is above all prayer. We are priest a priestly people who pray to the Father in communication, in communion with Christ, in the Holy Spirit. That's our priestly vocation. We don't need some guy up at the altar dressed up to do that. We are the people of God and we exercise our priestly vocation in prayer. And uh, 
our king kingship of course is exercised in our care for the planet and for um, ecological conversion and uh, um, use of uh, well the way that we live our lives I mean um, do we uh, support those organizations which use a lot of fossil fuel or do we support um, people who try to do without meat in their diet and so on these are ways of exercising our um, our super, not, I can't think of the right word, our care for the creation, which is our role as kings of creation, as um, those who, who care for creation. So I don't know if that's a help at all, but I think that's the way we exercise those three qualities which we're said to have been given at our confirmation. Of course, they were given to us at our baptism, and the two things ought never to have been separated, big mistake. But yeah, I think that's the way we exercise those things. But do come back and ask if I haven't made that clear. Thank you, Derek. Brendan, if I can cross to you, and, and just as we're mentioning, you know, the, the, the kingly vocation, the care for the environment and ecology, if I can take Virginia's question, who mentions that she joined the Global Catholic Climate Movement's Laudato Si Animators course and is involved in this ministry in her parish but that her newly acquired information, resources and skills, as well as passionate concern for solving the environmental crisis is wasted if our parish priests don't allow us to function effectively, she says. She believes that the answer might be for the Pope, the Vatican, Nuncios, for example, to ask the bishops to, to direct parish priests to look at this and discuss it during the Mass, in sermons, in homilies, in talks, in bidding prayers, for example, but also that priests to be asked by bishops to encourage the, the setting up of parish-based groups in this area. Do you agree? And what more could be done to help? Yeah, I, it's another sad situation because uh, that parish priest obviously never read Laudato, Laudato Si, or he's, he is not really in tune with Pope Francis. It's shocking to think that a person, you know, you're trying the future of our planet and uh, that she's been thwarted in, in, in this good move. So I, I, there's another, I, I, you can't be waiting, you go and see a bishop, one you know, bishop is not going to direct a parish priest. I, I, again, it's the problem. I think we have to work from from the bottom, because Virginia is doing fantastic work, and she's coming up against the stone wall, and she's thinking of writing to the Pope, the Vatican, papal nuncios, and all of that, and maybe just form a group within her own parish, and uh, meet in the parish hall, if that's allowable. For example, we're not allowed to, to meet in any parish hall around the place. We always have to spend money uh, in, in a, in a non-church environment, so which is dreadful too. So I think from her point of view, it, it's, she should, is a very, it's a prophetic voice she has she has a duty to it she's convinced of it and just go ahead and and form a group within your parish meet other parishioners in other parishes form groups and you can meet in each other's houses and continue that great work and it's the work of the spirit because the spirit that's where the the spirit is present in today so in such a movement, and she has the backing of the spirit there, and just go out, form our organisation, and know it's, it's difficult enough, meet in each other's houses, and give out leaflets after mass, we often do, and etc. you know, to just to use your imagination, but don't be deflected by the, the lack of cooperation from the institutional church. That's quite, an, and if you're being blocked, by the institutional church, that means you're on the right road. If you are getting the support from them, you know you're you're on the wrong you you know you're on the wrong road. You are certainly on the right road by because you're meeting all this resistance, and the resistance is is just shocking. But don't let it stop you. And I think that is our message to people: 
don't let this institutional church stop you because you are being led by the spirit the spirit is out there working all the time spirit I, i'd say I, the spirit is there in the gay pride movement there we are it's there in, in the environmental movement it's there all around where good is being done and so don't allow a bishop pope nuncios there to they will it will pass but your contribution will not, you have a duty there. And uh, Virginia, we really are, are so indebted to people like you. But do not allow yourself to be down oppressed by an institution that is not interested in the future of our planet. Thank you, Brendan. Derek, put the next question to you. And it's as, as we hear stories of a uh, Ireland effort by the right wing of the church to strongly influence the election of the next Pope, is that a clear sign amongst many that there is a battle for the soul of the church and it's essentially a battle between good and evil? Um, yes, I think it is a battle and there are certainly those within our church who are bitterly opposed to Pope Francis and all that he's doing. And one has to say that uh, one sees evil in all that because I think that many of these people are very dishonest um, and they are seeking power and so on. But I think Pope Francis is a bit canny in trying to appoint enough cardinals who will vote for someone similar to himself, and he's nearly at the, the number where it could happen, but it's, it's still on the edge. I forget how many more cardinals need to be appointed before a majority would be of his mentality. But he's gone a long way towards that, I think. But certainly I think that movements like the Latin Mass Society or Opus Dei and all those things, yes, I think they have a spirit of evil within them, certainly. Brendan, if I can cross to you um, and take Anne's question, who says, you know, we, we came into being, the Scottish Laity Network came into being through a governance issue in one diocese. And at present, we're still heavily concentrated in that diocese. Through the journey of discernment, though, it became clear that our vision of what the church should be is shared by others across Scotland. How can we enable those people to form local groups and at the same time maintain our shared vision and avoid fragmentation? Yes, uh, Callum. That is really the secret to our potential success is how we organize ourselves. And the secret really is, and we haven't been really that much successful, is to create local groups throughout the country who have, who contribute to the same aims as we do, and maybe not, but we're, we must be linked together and we form a, a local groups. And I wouldn't be worried about fragmentation. We, we formed ones down the south of Ireland and uh, we used to travel down and meet them. And how it began, uh, someone like that heard us on the radio or read something about us and contacted us, said, I'd love to, how do I go about it? So a few of us went down and met the person in her house and with other ladies and men, and uh, they formed a group. But uh, it needed support and we went down several times and uh, it became a very successful group and it still is there. And there are prayer groups around our country too. And it's just a matter of time. But if I wouldn't be worried about fragmentation, we must organize if surely there's someone in your group who's a good organizer and can actually, because we all have our different charisms. We're not all, all you know, someone can go to, you know, Callum, you're and your IT. And so each person has their own charism. And this is very important that we form local groups. And, and that's what the uh, Association of Catholic Priests They've been very successful in every diocese in, in Ireland. They have formed groups of priests and, and then they have their AGM and they, but they move down, they have regional meetings and all. So they have been very, very successful. And 
we have asked uh, maybe at your next regional one could we sort of sneak in the back door and meet you know uh, sort of meet with, with local people while the priests are meeting so it, it, it is a great gift. Priests are, are easier because they have, you know, they're already in their diocese. We don't have, we don't know where reform-minded Catholics are living and all of that. So that's a difficult, but it's only through, it's communication and communication, go to local, you know, a handout we send to all the newspapers, some of them print them and just say, there's a, you know, there's, the, the Scottish Laity Network, uh, they're in existence and they're looking for new groups. And if anyone is interested, contact, you know, whatever it is. But it, it, it's, I think, is it, it, so that's how the church is, is organized, the power of the church right throughout the world. It's a very well organized groups and it's very hard, to, you know. And, and so that's the example we have to. And I wouldn't be worried. Uh, the only problem is, is like happened with St. Francis when he started off the Franciscans, there, there was a great enthusiasm. And then the next fellow in charge comes along and he says, we can't have these fellows walking around the country preaching. We have to have rules. So rules came in, rules, regulations, and all of that. And that's what we have to avoid, rules and regulations. We have to be led by the spirit and... Uh, that is a difficult one and we have discernment and as uh, you have that and I, I you know and even listening to your prayer on the Holy Spirit it, it's just I, I think it's absolutely fantastic to that we have to depend on the Spirit to it because I, I don't know really what to do I, I'm depending on the Spirit and you know and I, I assume it's the good Spirit that's pushing us along and we need to be pushed along. And this is a, a, a this is a great movement. We're doing the work, the open stay. We're doing the work of God. And so, just do not allow. It's like Virginia. Don't be don't be put down by by bishops and priests. You have a vocation, and you're being led. This is a great work to do on ecology of the future of the planet. It's you, you may be gay. You have to be fighting for your right to be included in the church. Your equal dignity as anyone else. And so all these issues that uh, we are we are with all. That's where the spirit is today. And uh, the church always thought we own the spirit. You know, we have the seven sacraments. We have everything. You know, and, and if you don't obey them, you're out. And if you're outside the church, there's no salvation. You're going to hell. So th th imagine that, saying that to people. Outside the church, there's no salvation. Outside the church, there's no spirit. Outside the church, there's no God. So that's the type of thinking we, we were brought up with. So we have to break all of that and just break out of it and... Uh, and it's our example. It, it will come around. Right? Reform has to happen. Maybe not in my lifetime. But it, it, Romero used to say, I have a prayer. He said, you plant the seed, but you won't live to see the fruit, to see it's, you know, it's blossoming. So all we're doing is planting seeds here, there, all around the place. And the spirit will make sure that they grow and blossom. And that's Thank our job. You. Thank you, Brendan. And perhaps if I can squeeze in one final question and get a, a brief word from you, you both in response, it would be, what, if you were starting afresh, if you were starting again, what one thing would you do differently in setting up your, your organisation? What one thing would you do differently in starting again? If I can start with you, Derek. Right, well, <laughs> um, I don't know if I was starting again, I would probably do the same thing because it would be the only way that I would know how to get something going. But I think where I would want things to have moved differently would be in the emphasis on what uh, Brendan's been saying about the foundation of local groups. I think that um, we probably seem to be much too much of a national movement rather than supporting local groups and saying to people, look, you um, people who came to our original meeting, for instance, saying to them, look, there must be two or three like-minded people in your parish, get together, talk about things, um, 
break bread together, have a meal together, essentially. I think that's terribly important. And uh, support local activities around you, like the food bank or whatever. I think that's the way I would like our movement to have gone. And it's become, I think, much too much of a centralised movement. Thank you, Derek. And a word from you on the same topic, please, Brendan. Uh, when we began as We Are Church, we used to have five aims. And the five aims were exclusive on reform of the Catholic Church. And at one of our international meetings, there was a priest actually from Argentina. And he said, uh, you're very uh, European centrist, you know, Eurocentrist, that all you're worried about is reform of the church and this and that and the other. He says, so, you know, 95% of the people of the world are starving. And, and, and that's all you're worried about, this church, you know, reforming. So some groups, some groups, including ourselves, we did take it on board and, and we added that sixth aim. And it still is difficult because it's... Uh, the first question there that we, we encountered, who, who was it, Dan, I think, uh, put it forward. That is really the essential gospel message, you know, go out and uh, preach to the poor, you know, and, and so that is the message of Jesus. And and here, and maybe I, if I was, I, I started off with that and I came into the reform movement, but I can see the limitations of it that we spend, if I'm to spend the next 10 years of my life just looking for reform in the Catholic Church and I'm blinded to the reality of, of, of the majority of people on our planet. And I, I think we, we must be able to merge the two that the, the reform of the church and and, uh, and the reform of society it, it's a huge task but maybe it, it's not our job really but we do make statements you know if, if there is for example a housing crisis here in Ireland there is uh, we would join with the housing groups and add our names to it and if we publish in the paper we would have our names with all the other groups so it's important that we, we would be seen to take a stand. And then people can see like, okay, they're church, but they're also uh, interested in society. And it's, it's an essential part of Christianity to be uh, open to the poor, the voice of the poor. And it's just, I think that is, I find that a sort of a conflict all the time that I should be, and my, my family, would say, why don't you spend more time working with the housing crisis? That's a reality. And you're hitting your head against the stone wall with, all, with trying to change. And there's a certain truth in that. There's a, not a certain, but there's a 99% truth in it. So that is, the, that is my dilemma, really, to try and merge the two, because you cannot be just stuck in, in, a, in, in, in within a, 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 a circle that all we see is church, 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 reform of the church. And it's becoming less and less important in, in, in the world. And injustices in the world are thriving because, we, we, you know, we, we could spend all our time, really, if, if you all spent your time just exposing all these injustices, joining other groups, so anyway, it, it's uh, that's our that's my only regret. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Derek. I'm afraid uh, that is us out of time for the discussion. But thank you for for such an excellent. Discussion. And I will hand back to Monica. Indeed, thank you so much indeed, uh, and thank you, Cal, for orchestrating that so beautifully and uh, efficiently. <clears throat> Uh, Derek and uh, Brendan, you have given us a very wide-ranging, uh, candid um, expose of your, um, your own philosophies and theologies and uh, given us um, a wealth of information in terms of your insight and your experiences over the many years involved in your organisations. 
I think um, some key things in terms of really getting to um, grips with the uh, local needs and the local communities and spending energies there um, certainly has come um, through um, very strongly from both of you in terms of building up from the bottom and recognizing uh, that the Holy Spirit moves amongst the people and uh, to recognize and, and uh, act upon that. Um, areas where perhaps we may uh, uh, look to the future in terms of really engaging our, our wider uh, media platforms much more efficiently and effectively in terms of conveying what it is we're about and um, ex exercising um, a, a voice there certainly um, has, has, has come through uh, strongly as well. Um, got a lot of um, pent up frustration and um, perhaps a disappointment that um, there is uh, the, the, the difficulty to uh, overcome these immovable, immovable obstacles in terms of institutional um, uh, bigotry and um, intransigence within, within the established church. Um, but certainly, uh, despite all of that, uh, both of you giving uh, strategies and approaches as to how um, concerned uh, lay individuals working collaboratively with our, our clergy uh, can affect change uh, locally and to act a strong, strong call for action um, and um, to seek, uh, not to seek permission, um, but perhaps ask forgiveness uh, later. So um, recognize where the spirit is moving us and take courage in, in doing that. And, and indeed, uh, both of you have, have, have certainly uh, echoed that very strongly. So this whole notion of being visible um, and one of radical change in society, that, that indeed is what the whole message of, uh, of Jesus was about and not necessarily what the institutional church um, perhaps is, is, is espousing. So lots, lots more within there, uh, but an absolute delight uh, to hear both of your uh, insights and contributions. Uh, I think that's reflected in the depths and wealth of uh, questions that have been posed. And I must, um, express my sincere thanks on behalf of all our, our contributors tonight uh, for your time and for your generosity um, in your contributions and um, reflections. So if I might uh, perhaps um, on behalf of everyone, thank you both very much indeed uh, for, for that and um, invite uh, all of us please um, to join in a closing prayer when uh, we offer um, a prayer for both of you in terms of your ongoing ministries um, in the work you continue to do. Loving God, we thank you for the gift and ministry of Derek and Brendan. We thank you for what they have shared with us tonight. We ask that you anoint them anew with your spirit such that your life may be deepened within them. We pray that we may have the wisdom to see the face of Jesus in the face of all those we meet, the courage to do what is right, and the discernment to know exactly what you want us to do. Bless us with the grace to thirst and hunger for justice and grant us the gifts of patience, wisdom and perseverance. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our saviour and companion on our journey. Amen. So a sincere thank you to Derek and Brendan. You're absolute gentlemen and uh, you've been uh, a, a wonderful uh, couple tonight in terms of our ongoing discussion and engagement. I'm going to hand you back now to um, Rab, who's got some forthcoming uh, attractions to uh, draw our attention to as we continue on our journey. Rab. Yeah, our, our next event in terms of responding to the assembly is our eco conversation on Thursday the 27th of August, a fortnight tonight. It was one of the big things that came out of both the journey with Lorna Gold and then Father Augusto talking about the assembly. How as disciples of Jesus do we care for our common home? So if we could get the next slide.
So on the evening, we're hosting it. We'll have Eco Congregation Scotland, the Global okay. Catholic Climate Movement coming along, Justice and Peace Scotland, and SCIAF. Based on the print, one of the principles that, that came out of the, the journey and the assemblies, there is no point in us reinventing the wheel. That there is a lot of really, really good work going on within these organizations that could do with more support. And that may be where the spirit is calling individuals in the SLN to go. So it's really giving them a platform. So we really encourage as many people as possible to come along. And our final event that we've got booked, not that we're finishing anything, but it's just the one we've got booked next, is at the Season of Creation Retreat with Dermot Umurku. I, I struggle with pronouncing... Thank you very much. Right. Marco. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Dermot is coming along and it is what he's going to address us on is Christian discipleship and ecological sustainability. So for those who don't know Dermot, we'll be sending out some information on him. He travels all over the world, speaks incredibly engaging and exciting presenter, and that will be happening during the season of creation. So the event in a fortnight time is hopefully to help us prepare for the season of creation and then we're actually going to have the Season of Creation retreat within that, and more information will be coming out soon. Splendid. Well, thank you very much indeed, Rob. So I think um, it is good night from him, and it's good night from me, I think, uh, at this point. Um, so thank you indeed for, for joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing uh, most of you um, in, in these forthcoming events. <laughs>